Testing one, two, three, four. All right, I think we're good. <clears throat> Guys, if you happen to get here in the room, I'm going to be waiting up until right at nine o'clock to actually uh, start my conversation uh, about the topic of this video. So if anyone's listening, please let me know how the audio is, if it sounds good, if the lighting's good, all that kind of business. Um, I'm going to be checking the chat uh, all night. I will try to get to questions toward the end. Uh, let's see. But yeah, whenever you guys hop in, just let me know how the audio is. Please also let me know how the, uh, the lighting is and all that kind of stuff. So any of your all's help would be greatly appreciated as per always. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, Sam. Uh, like I said, I don't know if you guys were in here or not. Um, I'm just going to wait right up until nine. I just want to make sure that the lighting and the audio is good before I actually got into my talk um, in about four minutes. Mm. I'm also trying to send out some notifications as well on Instagram, just in case any of my Instagram followers uh, were going to be interested. Hey, Daniel, what's going on, man? Good to have you. Sam says, dude, I just came back from a uh, model shoot, noticed that you were live and caught it. Awesome. Hope it went well. Palantir1 says, keto for life. Yep. I started, um, I started the ketogenic diet. I actually, I shouldn't say diet. I, I honestly, I hate that word. Uh, lifestyle two years ago, two years ago, next month, it was right in, right in the middle of October, two years ago. So, so how'd the shoot go, Sam? Was it, um, was it paid work or was it portfolio building work? Got about two minutes, guys, and then I'll be starting. So just stick with me. I just wanted to make sure that the lighting, the audio was good before I actually got uh, started on my talk at nine. Went well, not paid work, portfolio work, uh, trying to get content to build my own YouTube channel. Also, finally used my gimbal. Nice. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that uh, tedious stuff, it has to happen before you can actually be s somewhat effective. <laughs> Got to do a lot of grunting and grinding before you can actually uh, make that fat cash. Depending on how the, the, the talk goes tonight, I think I might actually leave this uh, live stream up because I'm going to try to present a lot of information tonight that I think will actually be beneficial uh, for a lot of folks. So <clears throat> Sam says, uh, ain't that the truth? Lots of grunt work to be done and I'll probably still be poor. Hey man, poor and happy is better than rich and miserable, my friend. All right, we're about uh, 45 seconds away, and I will get started. One more check on Instagram here, right quick. All right, looks like we are good to go. All right, guys, thank you all so much for, you know, deciding to join me for this live uh, stream on how I managed to lose 50 pounds and actually get healthy. Uh, this is a large departure from what I usually do on my channel. I am predominantly a photography commentary style channel, but I did in fact have several people, uh, that have watched my channel for years. Uh, they had noticed that I had lost a lot of weight and, um, that weight loss, 
I guess was pretty dramatic if they had watched a long time ago and hadn't seen me in quite some time and then decided to come back and actually look at uh, the amount of weight that I have lost. Uh, I am not a big guy at all. I'm max like five, five. Um, so I am a relatively short individual and at my peak, I was right at, I would say around almost 200 pounds. Uh, and I think that that was pretty evident in most of my videos from the past. Uh, I think it became a lot more noticeable within the, I would say, probably last year to six months where uh, even in the face, the weight loss was not only dramatic, but also uh, extremely noticeable, even to me, like I, even I can see it. And, you know, when you look at yourself, you see yourself every day. So it's, it's so slow and so gradual uh, that a lot of times that, you know, you, your family members, you just don't notice either how much or how uh, dramatic the, the changes really are. Um, so I managed to lose 50 pounds. I was able to vastly improve my uh, blood work numbers. Um, and I got extremely healthy uh, when it comes to the lipid panels, the triglycerides, uh, all those different things, things that, you know, most people, uh, go to their doctor on a daily basis or on a yearly basis, their general practitioner, and to uh, actually uh, get those blood works, get those tests, you know, just sort of your regular yearly checkups. Um, I can remember the first year that I went, I had a baseline. It was probably about six or seven months before I actually started on this uh, lifestyle that I'm currently with. And during that period of time, I was kind of researching it. I was kind of interested. Uh, I've always been interested in health. It just never was priority, right? And it usually never is as long as everything is going good. Uh, when things are going well, you just don't really care. You know, it's just like, ah, you know what? I'll think about it tomorrow and I'll just blow this. I'll just blow this pizza up and think about the consequences later. Right. Um, and that was essentially my mentality almost the entire time. Uh, I, I knew better but I would just ignore it for the sake of enjoying, you know, either the food or the drinking or whatever, uh, at that time. And that was my issue was that when you're, you know, a certain age, like yeah, if you're in your twenties and your thirties, you, you just don't really care. You know, you think oh, I'm going to live forever. You know, you just, you're not thinking about your health. You're not really thinking about death or uh, thinking about complications from health uh, or diet or anything. You just, you're completely oblivious. You're completely unaware and you just don't really care. Right. And that was essentially my attitude the entire time. Uh, I just didn't care. And having that mentality is what caused me to always keep this extra weight on, uh, all the time. But it was also, uh, beginning to affect my outdoor activities. Uh, some of you all know that I'm an avid hiker and backpacker. Um, so when I would go out on extended trips, especially ones where I would be uh, doing the longer treks, like 20 mile days and stuff like that, my knees would just be horrendous. Uh, the inflammation was just horrendous. Um, the joint pain and the ability to actually enjoy my time outdoors was just not fun anymore uh, because probably halfway through it would just be so painful, but I was a stubborn mule and I would just fight through it and I would just go on anyway. Right. Uh, the inflammation was just so bad that it just, uh, it prevented me from enjoying myself while I was outdoors. And I was fed up with that. Uh, I enjoy the outdoors too much. Uh, I like, going places and I like seeing things and I like getting off the beaten path. Uh, I like those long hikes. I like to, uh, cover rough terrain and the path that I was going on, it was no longer going to allow me to do that. So I had to make a change and that's exactly what I did. So I did a lot of research leading up to, um, the, the point in October. So I had a, a baseline of blood work, uh, that I could draw from where I didn't care, where I was eating just exactly how I normally would. And 
uh, that was six or seven months before. So it was far enough away that I hadn't even tampered with my diet whatsoever. I had not changed or altered anything about the way that I would usually eat. So, you know, I was eating the standard American diet, high fat and high sugar. Um, and I was completely and totally inflamed. You get the beer gut, you get, you know, and it's not really a beer gut for everyone. A lot of people don't drink beer, but they still have that sort of beach ball in their midsection at all times. Um, and that is straight up inflammation. That is inflammation caused by diet. You are not fat because you eat fat. You are fat because you have too much insulin in your system. And what causes an insulin response? Sugar. Okay. So first thing I want to talk about uh, as far as where I began was it started with the ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet is roughly a heavily carb restricted, high fat diet. And for me, that was completely counterintuitive to everything that I had ever saw uh, in medical literature, uh, advice from doctors, uh, everything that you learned in school. You know, it was always, you know, whole grains, whole wheats, you know, lots of carbohydrates before your test. Uh, all that kind of stuff. That was what I was taught. That is what I believed. And uh, because I believe that, you know, low fat, everything, low fat yogurts, low fat, this low fat, you know, uh, I was, I was putting on more weight than I had ever put on in my entire life following that advice. And it wasn't until after I had this ridiculously rude awakening uh, somewhere uh, in, uh, I guess I was 39. I am now 41. And uh, so in 2016, I, I studied up and I, I absorbed as much as I could about the ketogenic diet. And even if it wasn't the perfect thing, I thought it was at least worth trying, right? Uh, I think that some of us kind of get to those points. But when you do a low-carb, high-fat diet, you also have to understand that it is not Atkins diet, okay? Uh, because the Atkins diet actually emphasizes low carbohydrate, high protein. And protein will even trigger more of an insulin response. It's even more unstable of a fuel source than fat is. You have three different types of responses to uh, the three major macro, uh, macronutrients. You know, you have carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Um, what I was noticing, and I did lots of experiments on myself with food. Food's a very easy experiment to try on yourself because most people do it three times per day. So I would eat something sugary, and then I would test my blood sugar. And I would see that it was just ridiculously out of control. Uh, and then I started making correlations. Well, what happens after, you know, an hour or two after I eat that food? And what would happen is I would spike blood sugar and then the sugar would crash. And when it would crash, I would immediately get sluggish. I would get tired. I would get sleepy. I would immediately want to go take a nap. Uh, I just, it was like brain fog city. And then I started thinking back over all the times that I had like quote unquote carb loaded, or I just gone to the pizza buffet and blew that shit up. Right. It was so dramatic. The amount of tiredness and brain fog and how I just couldn't really function after doing that to myself. And I would think about it, even like uh, on those, uh, you know, hangover Sunday mornings where I would want to say like eat gravy and biscuits or pancakes and syrup and, you know, waffles or whatever. I would eat that because I thought that that would make me feel better, but I would immediately want to go right back to sleep after eating. Okay. And that's essentially insulin response. When you eat sugar, your insulin goes through the roof. It spikes really, really hard because, uh, sugar is a very unstable fuel source for your body. And because it's so unstable, your, your body releases a massive amount of insulin, wants to get it out of the bloodstream as soon as possible. Because for those of you that don't know, sugar is as toxic, if not more so, than alcohol. Alcohol is 
fermented sugar. At least with uh, alcohol, only about 10% is metabolized in the brain and then the rest is taken care of by the liver. Uh, and your liver, uh, if you drink long enough, if you drink hard enough, you will eventually develop alcoholic fatty liver disease. The opposite is true when you eat massive amounts of sugar over an extended period of time over your life. So you start getting into, you know, around your late 30s, 40s, and 50s, you're, start, you're going to start developing what's called uh, insulin resistance. If you have eaten nothing but trash your entire life, uh, eventually the receptors in your cells, they stop responding to the insulin. It's just like they're trying to protect themselves. So they don't let the insulin push the fat into the cell. So as you eat more and more sugar over your life, the, the cells quit responding to the insulin response. So you become insulin resistant. And that's when you start getting into dangerous territory. You start developing type two diabetes. Uh, and then your pancreas, eventually, if you damage it too much, your pancreas will shut down altogether. And then there are some people that eventually become type one diabetics. My mother is a perfect example. She was a type two diabetic. In America, the American Diabetes Association recommends that you eat a uh, high carbohydrate diet. And if you want something uh, that has a little extra carbs that you normally wouldn't eat, they tell you to just take extra insulin to compensate for it. It's, it's ludicrous. But my mother is no longer a type 2 diabetic, thanks to the ketogenic and carnivore diet. Uh, we don't necessarily eat heavy carnivore diet. We do like to get lots of uh, greens and lots of cruciferous vegetables in there. Um, but she completely reversed her non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. She had a clogged carotid artery that is now completely fixed, completely gone. Um, she used to take 160 units of insulin per day, which is no longer even a thing. She no longer takes um, any diabetic medication whatsoever. And when she went to go see her diabetic doctor the last time, her doctor was so stunned so taken aback by her progress over the six months uh, and up to the, the, the year, her one year mark of being ketogenic, that she hugged her, said, I don't know how you're doing it. This is absolutely amazing. And whatever it is that you're doing, please continue. And please tell me so that I can tell my other patients. So no more diabetic medication. Most of the time you will be told that it cannot be cured, that it cannot be reversed, that diabetes has to be a disease that lasts for the rest of your life and that it can only be managed, which is 100% false. It can be reversed. It can be fixed and you do not have to live with it. Um, my story is only anecdotal. Um, it's not scientific. Um, it is not um, causal. You know, I don't have any like other than my blood tests, other than her blood tests. None, no other evidence exists. Um, but this is so counterintuitive to everything that I was taught that it was really hard for me to get my head around it because I was always under the impression if you eat fat, you get fat. And it's just not the case. Most of the time, our weight and our internal um, processes are 100% hormonal, whether it be from the adrenal gland, the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, the adrenals, the pancreas. All of those are glands that secrete hormones. And most people's weight problems have everything to do with hormonal imbalances more so than anything else. It's not, you know, uh, so much dietary fat. It is the responses to dietary fat combined with high dietary carbohydrates. So if the typical American diet is full of high carbohydrate and high fat foods, hot dog in a bun, hamburger in a bun, you know, heavy oils on a pizza, 
you know, every, just about everything breaded fish, you know, everything is high carbohydrate. Everything is breaded and deep fried, right? Unfortunately, uh, it is absolutely a disaster for your body. So, you know, it's crazy that not only is that's what we eat, but that is also what we are told to use in order to fix diabetic uh, issues. And it's just nuts to me. So as soon as I swapped over to a full and I fully committed, like I did not half-ass this. I did not, you know, just tippy toe in because you really can't. If, if you just tippy toe in and you do lots of high fat, but you're still adding sugar, you're still just eating um, an American diet, a typical American diet, but only worse because now you're really bumping up the fat and you're still holding on to the sugar, which triggers insulin which then tells the body to store fat. That's how it works. Insulin is a fat storing hormone. And if there is a lot of insulin present in the body, you're going to store your dietary fat. That's just the way it works. Um, I have provided links in the description, in the show notes down below the video. Um, and in that video or in those links, the first one I believe is to my girlfriend's cookbook. She actually wrote a cookbook after we tried for a year and a half to figure out all the different stuff that we like to eat here in America. Like we like good, typical American food. We like, you know, lots of stuff that we don't want to change drastically. We don't want to completely give up the way we eat. So she wrote this not only for us, but she also wrote it for my family. Uh, and my family all bought copies so that they would have it at, at hand. And, you know, it would be nice if you guys end up being interested and you all happen to pick one up. Great. I'm not peddling uh, her book. But what I will say is that a lot of the uh, recipes that we happened to find when we first started, they were kind of foo-foo and really complicated and required a lot of specialty ingredients and stuff that you can't always find at your local uh, grocery store. So what we wanted to do was to make something and, and keep food that we could eat and that we could find easily at like our local Kroger, you know, your local Piggly Wiggly or your local uh, uh, Walmart uh, grocery stores, those types of things. We wanted to be able to go almost anywhere and be able to find those foods. And as soon as I swapped over to the ketogenic diet, I immediately... And this is how fast it only takes a couple of days for your body to fully burn off every single bit of its sugar storage. And that includes the glycogen in your muscles. That includes the uh, stored uh, sugar in the, the liver and in the tissue. It doesn't take very long for you to completely get rid of all the sugar in your system. And you will become ketogenic almost immediately. Two to three days is all is just about all that it takes. If you're hyper aggressive, like I was, I fully committed. I did not pussyfoot around. I did the thing. I did not mess around. I wanted to take it serious and I wanted to be able to provide support for my mother who got onto the ketogenic diet about a month after I did. And I wanted to be her support because my mother was really sick. And she was really, really overweight. And I did not want her to be all alone. So I love my mother and I was not going to let her flounder out there all by herself. So that even if no one else did it for her or with her, I was going to. Immediately, the inflammation started going away. I could feel things just immediately beginning to deflate. You have two compounds in your body that will help you store water. One is sugar and the other is salt. As soon as you get rid of all the sugar, you dump roughly about 10 pounds of water weight. That's how much water the average human body will hold if you're eating a typical American diet. But during that water dump, I would get uh, a little bit kind of woozy and sick. And that is what's called the keto flu. The, there's a really easy way to combat it. Uh, you can take some Himalayan pink salt or some sea salt and just put a little bit in your water and just help yourself replenish those electrolytes that were flushed out during the water dump. And it goes away pretty quick. 
I think it lasted four hours for me because I was already anticipating it. Like I said, I'd already done a lot of my research uh, beforehand. I immediately felt myself start to, starting to deflate. So I lost about 10 pounds in the first four or five days. It did not take long. Uh, my diet for those first few days, honestly, up to the first week, I mean, I just tried to keep myself busy and, and not think because when you're, uh, when you are used to having a lot of carbohydrates in your diet, you know, if you ever gone to a Chinese restaurant and you'll eat the food and I mean, you will just stuff yourself completely, right? Completely full. And within an hour or two, you're starving again. There's no substance there. There's no real food there. They, they It's full of, you know, sugar and monosodium glutamate and it makes you feel full. It makes you feel like you've done some damage to that buffet. Uh, but you're you're hungry within just a couple of hours. It doesn't last very long. So what I did is I started, uh, I own chickens and I harvest my own eggs. And so I ate four eggs in the morning for breakfast and I would cook them in either coconut oil or, you know, olive oil. I would eat four to five slices of bacon in the more in the morning. Uh, and then I would drink water. You know, I would, I would keep myself hydrated and I would make sure that I sprinkled a little bit of salt on there to make sure that I was holding in some of uh, the electrolytes and that's what I would have for breakfast. And then I would eat like, you know, a hamburger or something with no bun. Uh, you have to be really careful because you don't want to take in a whole lot of protein because it will kind of spike your insulin uh, much like just straight up carbohydrates will. Uh, protein uh, will eventually convert into some form of glucose uh, in the digestion process. And then, you know, for like snacks and stuff like that, I would eat like nuts, fatty nuts, like macadamia nuts, uh, pecans, walnuts, things like that. And there are infamous other types of foods called fat bombs. And you're more than welcome to look those up. Uh, they're actually quite delicious. They taste a lot like Reese's, uh, like Reese cups and, and stuff. So they're full of uh, coconut oil. And so really, really fatty. Uh, unsweetened uh, cocoa powders. You can put all kinds of nuts and seeds and stuff in there to fatten them up. And those, uh, that's what I would use as my snacks. So I just stayed full with fatty foods until my body was fully converted over into a fully ketogenic state where I was burning my own body fat or my dietary fat instead of sugar. So after I started to deflate, I started noticing that my knees didn't hurt anymore. Uh, I noticed that I slept better. Uh, I quit snoring. Uh, my sleep apnea. Well, I was never diagnosed with sleep apnea, but the girlfriend would always say, I think you've almost died a couple of times tonight, you know. So that went away. Uh, so the snoring, the sleep got better. All of that stuff started going away. I immediately felt more energetic. I immediately started to feel uh, less hangry around my meal times. Uh, I felt like I could go longer in between my meals. And that's, as, uh, that's essentially what ended up happening. I, I went from three meals per day and I went down to two meals per day. And now I'm all the way down to one meal a day. I eat once a day, every single day. I eat roughly around anywhere from between 1030 and noon every day, somewhere in there, whenever I have time. Today, I don't even think I ate until around 2 p.m. It was a busy morning and I just didn't have time to get to it. But I wasn't hungry. Because my body had switched over from burning sugar, I wasn't hangry and pissed because there wasn't any sugar in my system anymore. Uh, it just started to self-cannibalize. What it, it go? Your body will begin to go through in a, a process called autophagy, where when you don't have food in your stomach, you will begin to eat your own body fat. And that's essentially what losing weight is is you begin to eat your own body fat. So if you have any, you know, little pockets of fat here and there, uh, after you've slimmed up, you know, that's what the body will feed on. That's what it will sustain it uh, until it gets its next meal. Um, so over the course of the next two years, um, I began to incorporate more and more uh, things from the ketogenic community into my life. Uh, Intermittent fasting, 
that's not for everyone, but I do it. Um, if I'm not hungry, I just don't eat. I only eat when I'm hungry. Um, when I am hungry, I tried my best to only eat high quality food. Um, a lot of people go, Oh, this is, this is a great, this is the best diet I've ever heard of. I get to eat all the fat and butter and bacon and stuff that I want forever and ever. Yay. You can technically. Yeah. But, um, eventually you want to start pulling it back enough that you will start to eat on your own body fat. You have to eventually, at some point, if you're if weight is your goal and not necessarily health, you have to rein back on the uh, fat that you take in your diet so that you start to kind of live on the fat that you've stored because your insulin was so high forever. Um, and you also have to think about this whole process as an evolutionary process. This was a way to survive as a human being say a hundred thousand years ago, this was a way for us to survive during the winter. Think about all the sweet stuff and when it comes in season, all your fruits and all of your gourds, all of your root vegetables and stuff like that. All of those come in season at the end of the year, all of your corn, all of your watermelons, all that stuff. It all comes in season at the end of the year. And as human beings, we would find those things. We would find potatoes and we would find berries and we would find apples and, and all that kind of stuff. That's what we would eat. And our insulin would get spiked and we would still be able to find kills. You know, we would, we would kill a deer, we would kill a bear, we would kill a buffalo, and we would eat the fat with our sweet foods that were in season at that time. And the more insulin we had in our body at that time, the more of the fat that we would store and the longer we were able to survive when food was scarce during the winter time. And you would basically be intermittent fasting all throughout winter because food was not as plentiful. You didn't have any greens to eat. You, you definitely didn't have any fruits or berries to eat. Uh, you might find an, an old nut under the snow or something every now and then, but you would have to kill a rabbit or, you know, something like that, it, it, your food would be in much, much more scarcer. Uh, you, there was more scarcity, obviously, in the wintertime. So you were uh, intermittent fasting throughout the wintertime and you would eat and you would live on your own body fat. So when it comes springtime, oh, you was all, you was all skinny and stuff again. <laughs> you know, you had been living on your own body fat. You're like, oh, it's so cold. I don't feel like going hunting today. So you just live on your own body fat. And uh, it's honestly, it's not as bad as it sounds. I know to a lot of people that sounds just absolutely terrible. Sounds absolutely horrendous to think that you might have to go a day or two without eating. But uh, it's really, it's, it's a mind game with yourself. You also have um, another hormone that's released in the body, much like insulin, uh, but it's called ghrelin. And ghrelin is the hormone that tells you, hey, you're hungry, get something to eat. But have you ever noticed that if you got hungry uh, and you, I mean, you were just really hungry, but if you waited a couple of hours, maybe you got busy with something, maybe you were, you know, working on your car, or you were doing something, uh, you would forget that you were hungry because you were busy. And then you weren't hungry again for another three or four hours, right? Well, that is a hormone and it's only released. It's cyclical. It's only released in a certain amount of times per day. So if you can fight through it, if you can keep yourself busy, if you can, you know, not think about it, it goes away and, uh, it, it, it spikes for a few and then it goes away and then you're, you're not hungry anymore. For about three or four hours. I think it's released uh, on a cyclical cycle of like four or four to six hours, something like that. So if you can ignore it, if you can get past it, you're going to be great. So, and that's what I do. Uh, there are sometimes I'm just like, you know what? I don't need to eat today. Like I, I, I ate a really, really big meal yesterday and I could do without, you know, that extra tonight. I don't have to have it and I'm just going to go ahead and skip it. And it takes a lot of self-discipline to push a plate back. Uh, food tastes delicious. Uh, it's it's hardwired into our brain to say, I want that and I want as much of it as I possibly can get because I don't know, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, I don't know when my next meal is. But in, to the, in today's plentiful society, it's always available, which is a problem because 
evolutionarily, we are not prepared to eat three times a day plus snacks in between and grab a quick little, you know, milk and cookies right before bed. Most people are eating six meals per day and they're just constantly spiking insulin all day. Even skinny people can be fat on the inside too. Uh, and most of the time that ends up uh, as visceral fat. It, it collects around all the organs and penetrates into the muscle tissue. So even skinny people can be fat on the inside. Um, so my journey from eating complete trash all the way to losing 50 pounds and having some of the best blood work numbers of my entire life has all stemmed from the, uh, the fact that I got rid of a toxic substance that is found in almost everything now. And it's found in everything because it's cheap to make, it's cheap to produce, it's cheap to refine, and it has become a filler in everything. The breads, even the stuff that you wouldn't think. You know, you think bread, yeah, definitely, that's a carbohydrate. Your cereals in the morning, definitely carbohydrates. Your, your, your Pop-Tarts, you know, definitely carbohydrates. But, you know, you start thinking about your pasta. You start thinking about your pasta sauce. They even put sugar in the pasta sauce. You start thinking about your lunch meats. They put sugar in there as fillers in like your lunch meats. They put it everywhere. And if you're not a, a label reader, which you do kind of have to become, because most of the stuff that you're going to find in grocery stores, I mean, it is, it's trash. It really is. It is complete and total trash. Um, you're going to find sugar everywhere. And you just think about that, 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 that level of sugar toxicity. Just think about if you were on a slow drip of straight up alcohol for 40 years of your entire life, you would definitely have jaundice from having fatty liver and basically having kidney and liver failure. That's essentially what happens to us. And we become diabetic. We end up having fatty liver. We end up having this beach ball in our stomach. It's in inflammation, everything in our gut, where it lands, where that sugar lands, it's all inflammation all day, every day, six times a day. I need my cookies. I need that pizza. I'm going to eat that hoagie for lunch. I'm going to Biscuits and gravy. I want my waffles, my pancakes, all that other stuff. It's just constantly, it's, it's all right. I'm going to have a couple of beers after work. It's just a constant bombardment of sugar all day, every day. And, uh, we just don't, we just don't even realize it. Uh, then eventually we do get diabetes and you got to go to the doctor and then you got to start taking your insulin injections. So thankfully I caught it in time. Um, I never developed any sort of full blown diabetes. I do believe to a large extent that I was probably a pre undiagnosed pre diabetic. I think 60 to 75% of everyone in this country is pre diabetic. Uh, I don't really, uh, have the stats for any other country, uh, the UK or Great Britain or Australia, uh, they usually get studied quite heavily, but honestly, I don't know the stats there. Uh, but they just released a new report just a few days ago uh, that was saying that uh, 75 or no, it wasn't 75. It was like 45 or something, uh, maybe even 55% of every single person in the United States either has prediabetes or is full blown type two diabetic right now. And that has everything to do with diet. So I, um, I eat a lot of high quality food. I try to eat the fattier cuts of meat. Uh, if they're well marbled, you'll find more of it. You know, uh, it'll, it'll be, it'll be sparsely in the muscle tissue. You can always tell a good piece of, uh, meat by the way. Now this is assuming that you actually eat meat. Uh, you can get plenty of fats elsewhere, avocados, all your nuts and seeds. Uh, coconut oil is a really, really good saturated fat. Um, if you're not straight up vegan, you can eat cheeses and eggs. Um, that will usually do it. You need the, um, the iron and stuff from the saturated fat from animals. Uh, evolutionarily speaking, that's what we ate were animals. And, um, that is what, uh, physiologically and, and, and biologically, that is what we're, uh, 
conditioned to have in our system. So you do need a lot of saturated fats. You don't want any of them to be free. You don't want like the polyunsaturateds and all that. Stay away from corn oils. Stay away from soybean oils. All of that is like GMO oils. Uh, it's just trash. It's garbage. It's been hydrogenated. So I eat a lot of raw coconut oil, uh, lots and lots of uh, olive oil. I saute onions and wilt my lettuces and spinach and all that kind of stuff in my um, olive oils. And I eat uh, well-marbled cuts of meat. Uh, I eat a lot of uh, uncured bacon, uh, lots of uncured pork in general, because it's generally quite fatty, um, depending on what they're fed. If the animal is fed a lot of grain, if they're fed a lot of wheat, then they are going to have fat in all the wrong places, just like we do. So uh, I try to eat as much as I possibly can grass-fed beef, grass-fed pork, free-range and pasture-raised chickens uh, only um, and like I said, I, I, I own chickens. I have about 40 birds and I let them free range and eat grass and bugs and let them get their proteins naturally and let them eat their grass and get their fiber naturally. And then I eat their eggs. Um, and it's some of the most delicious tasting eggs I've ever had in my life. And, you know, it doesn't cost a whole lot to keep birds, but I know that not everyone has the luxury of a, uh, a really large place to do that. But the links that I have provided down in the description. The first one obviously is uh, to this. So if you want easy stuff to help you lose weight and to help re uh, recondition you, uh, my girlfriend wrote it. So you all know what she looks like. That's her picture. So I'm not just shilling uh, someone else's stuff. This is actually our stuff and we eat this stuff every single day. Um, the second link is to my favorite ketogenic doctor on YouTube. And that is Dr. Eric Berg. Um, he is not overly scientific. He is not overly technical. So you you won't get bored watching his videos. You'll you'll get a lot of information, and you'll you'll be well educated. Uh, and he does dive down into some of the more technical stuff uh, a little bit when he's asked to. Um, he does lots of interviews with other ketogenic uh, professionals in the uh, community. Uh, he does quick short. Uh, bite-sized bursts, stuff that everyone seems to like because everyone's attention spans about three uh, minutes long these days. So he tries to keep them very, very short. So he, if if you've got a question at all whatsoever about ketogenic, like, can I have this? Or is this a good thing to do on, you know, ketogenic diet or whatever? Any kind of question like that, he's already made a video about it. That, that's the reason that he's like the encyclopedia of keto. So it's really easy to go, well, I'm not really for sure. Can I have this or can I do this? Or is this a good thing for me to, to, uh, to do or to try? He's already done a video. All you have to do is just do a search on his channel and he's, he's got it. So he's like the encyclopedia. Uh, so he's the one that I go to for just quick answers. I've been doing it long enough now that uh, I've got it pretty well down. But if there's ever something that's just a little, well, I'm not really for sure. I just go to his channel, look it up, and then I follow uh, the rabbit down the rabbit hole. Uh, if you are more of an intellectual, if you prefer your uh, information to come uh, in a more scientific, uh, a more researched, and more um, sort of like a symposium style, uh, uh, Dr. Jason Fung is a fantastic doctor uh, who has done lots and lots of lectures. And I've actually, uh, I didn't put it in the description box, but there's another channel called Low Carb Down Under. Uh, I believe they call it that because the conference that they now do was started uh, in Australia. Uh, and now they kind of have little conferences and stuff uh, all, over the, all over the world. But all of their presentations, all of their symposiums and stuff, they're, you know, roughly between, I don't know, I'm going to say 20 to 45 minutes long. And I love them to death because they do get into depth. Uh, they do get into the meat, no pun intended, uh, of the, the topics like, you know, specific things like, what about my cholesterol? You know, what about the triglycerides? Um, and they give it all in very scientific, very uh, information overload style. And I appreciate those kinds of videos on occasion. I've probably watched about 40 of those videos. 
So about 40 hours of my life has been dedicated to watching because some of the best uh, low carb, high fat uh, ketogenic doctors have spoken at those symposiums. You would not be doing yourself any disservice whatsoever by watching those videos. So um, I had now have some of the best blood work I've ever had in my entire life. My inflammation is now gone. All of my joint pain is now gone. I have lost 50 pounds. I was almost at 200 pounds and I'm at 153 pounds now. Um, so I guess I'm just going to stop my conversation here. I think I could probably talk about this forever, but I did want to kind of get to the uh, chat a little bit and see if you guys uh, were saying anything cool having anything interesting to say, or if maybe you all had any questions for me. Whew, long video. Okay. Long Rider says, thank you, Mark. I'm very interested in this. You look great. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Uh, Daniel says, so much of this is true. I went from 240 to 145 pounds in a year and a half on a plant-based diet. While I wasn't eating just fat, I cut out all a lot of the carbs, all sugar, dairy, and animal products. See, uh, a lot of people, uh, they a lot of people will cut out dairy products, um, but you are cutting out some of the nutrients. You might be able to get them in other places, but I, I'm really appreciative of the uh, saturated fats um, because most of the vitamins and minerals that we need to live on a day-to-day -day basis, most of them are fat-soluble vitamins. So you need a heavy dose of fat. So even on the days when maybe I don't want to eat meat, uh, because meat's expensive, right? And it is much easier to have like... Um, a salad with lots of nuts and seeds and stuff like that. I'll just drizzle my salad full of olive oil or, you know, some uh, coconut oil or something like that so that I can get my fat uh, so that the minerals and nutrients and the potassium and all that stuff from those vegetables. That's how they'll be soluble is in that fat. You can't just like, you know, drink some water. A lot of people will take vitamins, vitamin supplements or whatever, and then they wash it all down with, with some water. You know, you need that fat food, certain foods were made to go together. So if you eat organ meat, you know, like salami or pastrami or pepperoni or whatever, you know, you've got a lot of vitamins and minerals in there. And a lot of it has to be mixed in with that fat in order to be soluble. And you need that fat to go along with those minerals so that you actually absorb them. And, uh, a lot of people, they'll just take those vitamins or whatever, and they'll just swish around a little bit of water, and that's good enough for the day. It's like, hey, I took my Flintstone vitamin today, which, you know, it's it's a nice gesture, but you need the fat in order to uh, metabolize and, and, and utilize those vitamins to their maximum effect. Um, <clears throat> Daniel also says, keto has a lot in common with the plant-based diet. And I'm honestly, I, I probably eat more uh, salad and seeds and nuts and use the olive oil and my coconut oil more so than I eat meat. Um, just because meat is more expensive product, you know, and I love, I love animals. You know, I'm not opposed to killing animals, you know, and eating animals. Um, it's a, it's a horrible thing. I'm a huge animal lover. I'm a militant animal lover as a matter of fact, but, um, you know, I realize that physiologically, uh, biologically we have evolved to what we are today because of our dependence on eating wild game, whether it be deer or bison, you know, buffalo, uh, you know, wh whatever we could find, rabbits, squirrels, just whatever. Um, that is how we evolved. And I would like it not to be that way, but the fact of the matter is, is that it is, that it is that way. And uh, in the times that we would be hunting for food, you know, we would eat lettuces we would eat wild onions we would eat wild leaves and stuff like that to kind of satiate us until we finally made the kill and then we would you know maybe mix up some of that stuff in the stew pot and we would maybe you know throw the bone in there we would eat we would eat everything we none of it went to waste even the skin didn't go to waste we would wear it as clothing or you know cover our homes make hats out of it, make gloves out of it. Um, so nothing ever went to waste. We would eat the bones uh, in the marrow. Um, and there are so many nutrients in bone marrow. Uh, I actually love bone marrow stew, you know, and cooking the meat with the marrow and making sure that I get all of what I need. You know, I, I don't want to waste anything. If that animal had to die for me to survive, I don't want to do it 
any injustice by waste being wasteful. So um, Sam says, I'm wondering about this uh, trans fat thing. Also, uh, where we've been told it's bad for so long. The trans fat is technically bad. The trans fat is essentially what all the restaurants had swapped to for a long time, um, which are like, you know, your, your trans fats are your vegetable oils, you know, your s- safflower, your soybean oil, your corn oils. Those are trans fats. They are all genetically modified uh, oils. They are not natural oils. It, it takes, I mean, go out there and squeeze any, any, ear of corn and you're never going to get a drop of oil out of it. You have to do so much processing, so much refinement, so much uh, stuff in order to get any oil out of soybeans and in corn. It's just not natural. I mean, it takes a chemical lab induced process in order to get oil from those vegetables. They're not very rich in any type of oil. So trans fats are horrendous. Uh, They're extremely inflammatory uh, and they should be avoided at all costs. Most everything, any kind of baked goods that you're going to buy off the shelves in the stores, they are absolutely stuffed with trans fats. And obviously if you're eating a a Twinkie or a Ho-Ho or whatever, not only is it full of the trans fat, it's also full of sugar. So you're getting the double whammy from inflammatory substances. So your gut just keeps getting bigger. Everything just starts puffing out and swelling. Your joints are just constantly hurting you all the time. Um, And you just stay inflamed constantly. But if you want to strip that fat out of your system, if you want to lower that inflammation, if you want to lower all that stuff, you eat lots of cruciferous vegetables, lots of Brussels sprouts, which I know sounds horrendous. I just began to love Brussels sprouts when I, in, in the last two years, absolutely hate it. Hated cauliflower, eat it almost all every day. Now, um, broccoli, hated broccoli, couldn't stand it. Hated spinach, hated greens in general. I was a five-year-old in a grown man's body. If it didn't come on my pizza, I'm not eating it. And I usually got the meat lovers. <laughs> But um, yeah, so eating lots of cruciferous vegetables helps to strip the fat off the liver and helps get it into your system so that it can be actually it can actually be burned for fuel. So I eat salads now more than anything. And the fat that I do have, I usually just try and drizzle or I'll have a couple of rolls uh, of, you know, maybe some lunch meats or maybe a small cut of a pork chop or something on the side with my salad. And, you know, it, it works out really good because it's not, I'm not depriving myself. I eat bread still, but not the kind of bread you were thinking. I eat my own bread. I make anything, bread sticks or my pizza crust. I make it out of almond flour. It's in here, guys. I eat almond flour when I want to eat bread. But honestly, I don't have much, I don't miss it anymore like I thought I would. When I drink coffee, I don't put milk in my coffee anymore. I put heavy whipping cream. It's fattier. It keeps me full all morning. When I do a morning jolt, hey, everybody, welcome to the morning jolt. That thing is full of heavy whipping cream. Do my coffee, do a couple squirts of liquid stevia, and dump some heavy whipping cream in there, and maybe just a splash of uh, coconut oil. Blend it up with one of those little stick blenders best thing you've ever had. It will keep you satisfied all the way until around 10, 11 or noon, somewhere around in there. And that's when I start getting hungry for my brunch. And then that's the only meal I'll have for the entire day. And then I'll drink another coffee around four o'clock in the afternoon. And then I'm usually in bed by nine or 10 because I got to get up at four o'clock in the morning and deal to deal with my, you know, my YouTube channel. And I've also got animals that I've got to take care of and stuff like that. So I I do a lot of stuff. Uh, Mario Vargas says, uh, thanks for sharing this. I started about two months ago and my blood pressure has dropped. And so have my pants. (laughs) That was the other thing too, is your blood pressure because you're not holding as much water uh, from all the inflammation and the sugar. 
If you have high blood pressure, it will drop significantly. Your doctor will be absolutely amazed. True story. Sam says, uh, you're right about the fact that evolutionarily speaking, we aren't made to eat three to four times a day plus snacks. I remember watching a scientific video regarding this uh, a long while ago. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if food just wasn't that plentiful. You know, you had to, when you did eat, you had to work really hard to catch that whatever was running away from you. You know, you walk out into the woods today and you just, you're, you're not going to find just apples and pears and cherries and shit just all growing around you. You're not just going to walk up to a tomato plant and grab one. It's sparse. And most of the stuff that you could eat would be like the little wild onions, little thing, little berries. Every now and again, you'd find, you know, a bush on the... You know, on the off chance that you happen to walk into a blackberry patch or something like that, you know, you had to fight all the briars. You had to fight all the 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 stickers and stuff just trying to get in there and get them. So it was kind of a pain in the ass, but you had to work really hard to eat. It was it wasn't just slide. Let's just slide up to this buffet right here. Let's get it done, you know, and then literally pile three to four meals and shove it all and cram it all into one meal. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a problem of bounty. We have too much. Uh, Oh, thank you so much. Long rider. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't notice the chat, man. Uh, you didn't ask anything. You didn't say anything. So thanks, man. Appreciate you. I really do. I don't get many super chats and you are super nice. But yeah, we just, we just have too much and we eat too much. We think about food because our insulin is always spiking. We're constantly keeping our, our blood sugar high. We are constantly keeping that insulin response going all the time. Uh, and that triggers hunger. When that blood sugar crashes, that's when you get hangry. You're like, I got to eat soon or I'm going to lose my mind if I don't get something in my stomach. But when you eat fat, and a lot of it, and it, it keeps you satiated, you eat until you're satiated. Don't stuff yourself, but you eat until you're satiated. And that fat burns so slow and so evenly and so cleanly, there is no spike and then crash. Protein kind of goes like a big hump. But fat, it does a little bit of an up and then just burns slow and clean and long. So you're just not hungry. It is such a joy to be able to just go out and do something for the day and not be constantly thinking about food because you're full and you stay that way all day. Uh, let's see. What else do we got? Uh, Michael Brown says, uh, that's why sugar is the most, uh, is the deadliest drug in this country. It absolutely is. And it's in everything. It's everywhere. Even the stuff that you would not expect it to be in, you'll find it there. If you Because now they're allowed to call sugar so many different things. Maltodextrin, dextrose, cane sugar, high fructose corn syrup. You can find, literally, you have to read labels. And the less stuff that's in it, the better off. But if you do, if you see maltodextrin, if you see dextrose or the high fructose corn syrup or any of those things, any of those oses, sucralose, you know, all those kinds of oses, be weary of them. You know, take note and, and try to avoid them if you can. Um, see, <laughs> Boogernator says, eat cow, yum. Yeah, I mean, I hate to say it because cows are so damn cute, but I mean, I eat it. I eat a cow's ass. I'd be just like, mm, mm, that was so good. Mm. I mean, they are, they're, they're delicious. They're delicious animals, but they are so cute. I would hate to go out there and put one down myself. I just I'm not a fan. I'm really not a fan. Um, uh, Mario Vargas says, Dr. Eric Berg is great. I follow him on YouTube. Yep. I've been following him for probably the last two and a half to three years. Um, and his short burst videos are absolutely invaluable to anyone that is wanting to reverse their diabetes, lower their blood pressure, lower those blood sugars, stop taking insulin, lose weight. It's not always the most important thing, but it is a side effect um, of having normal hormones. Your adrenals will work better. You'll, you won't have as much adrenal fatigue. Your 
uh, hypothalamus will work better. Your thyroid will work better. Your pituitary, everything will just start to regulate itself. It really will. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Kevin Evans says, hopefully they will make the stem cell meat cost effective. Yeah, probably not though. I, 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 I don't see it happening. I think that the natural process of a cow or a goat or sheep or chicken being happy and healthy its entire life living out there in the field, in the pasture, not knowing a day of sorrow, not being stuck in a factory farm, being out there in the sunshine, eating good quality grass on, you know, well manicured and well taken care of pasture. Happiness brings about wellness. And when you're, when you're not happy and when you're stressed, uh, it affects you. It, it releases hormones and chemicals in your body. And when those cows are being shoved into those places, when those chickens know they're about to die, like everything gets very stressed. So when you can keep the stress down their entire life and they only have to be fearful, you know, for a, just a few seconds right before um, the killing blow, so to speak, uh, that is the healthiest animal that you or I could ever consume. And I want always for uh, my food to be humanely dealt with. I don't want my animals to be suffering. Uh, I don't want them to be unhappy. I want them to eat good food and have a happy, healthy life so that I can, in turn can have a ha happy, healthy life. So uh, I've gone uh, now over an hour. Okay. Uh, one more thing. And then I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and cut it off. But I really do hope that everyone uh, was able to get something from this. Uh, Long Rider says processed sugar and fats uh, were started during the Industrial Revolution and peeps moved into cities. So food needed to be stored. Diabetes rates increased coincide with that period of history. And it really does. Uh, it's also massively increased since the Ansel Keys study in the 1950s, where he basically demonized saturated fats as the culprit for people getting fat. And then the, you know, government hops on board and then we get the food pyramid where fat and oils, very small amounts, lots of bread and pasta and sugar and stuff down at the bottom, whole wheat and whole grains, you know, just none of it's really good for you. Um, it's, it's, it's inflammatory and, uh, try, try it out for yourself. Just quit eating any sugar <coughs> for two days. Anyone can do it for two or three days and just see how you feel. Watch your weight drop. Watch the inflammation and the swelling in your stomach. You'll just feel better. You were meant to eat saturated fat, not muffins and biscuits and crackers and pancakes and waffles and pasta and pizzas. You can have some of those things. Just substitute <coughs> the regular wheat with almond flour. That's what I make all of my bread with now. And all of that inflammation completely gone. Um, so anyway, guys, I really do hope that you all enjoyed this video. And, uh, you know, a couple of people have been asking me, you know, how did you lose the weight? And I thought, you know, this is a perfect opportunity for me to talk about something that I genuinely love and enjoy. So if you guys are interested in really easy, cheap to make recipes, check this out. If you have keto questions, check out Dr. Eric Berg's link down in the description below. And if you like the more scientific stuff, check out, uh, Dr. Uh, Jason Fung, you can find his videos, just do a, a YouTube search and he's all over the internet. I mean, he's everywhere. He just doesn't have like a whole lot of stuff on his official channel. So, all right, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys found it useful. And if you did, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and I will see you guys again on the next one. Peace.